Good morning, and thank you all for being here, and thank you to the World Bank and IMF for hosting the spring meetings. I know that it will be a productive week. Let me begin by outlining a few of our key priorities for this week, and then I'll turn to your questions. First, I'm looking forward to working with my counterparts on the global macro economy. During the G20 in February, I said that the global economy was in a better place than many predicted last fall. That basic picture has remained largely unchanged. Prices of commodities like food and energy have stabilized, supply chain pressures continue to ease, and global growth projections remain higher than they were in the fall. This progress is due in part to the steps we have taken. Those include macroeconomic policies within our own borders and joint actions like the Black Sea Grain Initiative that have helped lower food costs. The price cap is also helping stabilize global energy markets while reducing Russia's primary source of revenue. In the United States, our labor market remains strong. Our unemployment rate is near historic lows. Inflation remains too high, although we have seen welcome signs over the past half year that inflation is moderated. As we tackle our immediate challenges, the United States is also making historic long-term investments in the productive capacity and resilience of our economy. For example, the Inflation Reduction Act is spurring a wave of clean energy investments, which will have significant positive spillovers across the globe. Still, we remain vigilant to the downside risks for over a year now, the world has contended with the negative consequences of Russia's illegal war against Ukraine. Many countries are still recovering from the pandemic shock, and in some countries, including the United States, there have been recent pressures on our banking systems. I've been in close communication with my counterparts over the past few weeks on these developments, and I look forward to continuing that dialogue this week. Here at home, the U.S. banking system remains sound, with strong capital and liquidity positions. The global financial system also remains resilient due to the significant reforms that nations took after the financial crisis. We're committed to continuing this work through bodies like the Financial Stability Board and the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Financial regulators across the world are finalizing the implementation of Basel III and addressing vulnerabilities in non-bank financial intermediation. We're also focused on monitoring and adapting our regulatory frameworks to risks posed by digital assets and the changing climate. Second, debt overhang remains a significant economic headwind for many to many countries. I saw this firsthand in Zambia, whose economy has suffered under the weight of default. More than half of all low-income countries are near or in debt distress. We know that the impacts of debt crises do not respect boundaries. They can have cascading effects on the global economy. In the past few weeks, we have shown that concerted engagement can result in breakthroughs. We are encouraged that China has agreed to provide specific and credible financing assurances in the Sri Lanka case. This has enabled the IMF to move forward with the financial support and economic reform program. It's vitally important that all creditors, including China, now deliver on their commitments. We will also continue to urge action in other critical cases, and this includes the completion of debt treatment for Zambia and the rapid establishment of a creditor committee for Ghana. We also know that there's considerable room for improvement in the international debt restructuring process. This week, ministers across creditor and debtor countries, as well as representatives of private creditors, 
will con convene for the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. I look forward to a re robust discussion on improvements to the common framework process for low-income countries and the debt treatment process more broadly. Third, I look forward to additional coordination with our allies to support Ukraine as it continues to defend itself against Russia. Around this time last year, the world learned of the atrocities committed by Putin's military in Bucha. One year later, Russia continues its illegal and unprovoked war against Ukraine. During my trip to Kyiv in February, I saw firsthand the resilience and bravery of the Ukrainian people. And I heard from Ukrainians directly about the critical impact of our continued sec economic security and humanitarian assistance. The United States is proud to be part of a broad coalition that is supporting Ukraine in its darkest hour. I'm particularly encouraged by the executive board's approval of the IMF's reform program for Ukraine. This program will contribute to international efforts to meet Ukraine's economic needs, and it will underpin President Zelensky's good governance and anti-corruption reform efforts. The program will also lay the foundation for Ukraine's longer-term reconstruction. As President Biden has said, the United States will stand with Ukraine for as long as it takes. I'm encouraged that the IMF, multilateral development banks, and our partners are also standing with Ukraine in its time of need. Lastly, it's important to note that we are at an important point of transition for the World Bank. Six months ago, I issued an urgent call for an evolution of the multilateral development bank system. In the 21st century, sustained progress on poverty alleviation and shared prosperity requires building resilience against the global challenges that face us all. These include climate change, pandemics, and fragility and conflict. I'm encouraged by the progress that we've made with a growing coalition of shareholders since my call to action last fall. We're refreshing the World Bank's mission. We're taking initial steps to improve the bank's operational model. And we're responsibly stretching its balance sheet to deliver up to an additional $50 billion of lending over the next decade. This week, I look forward to discussing these important reforms and many more to come over the course of this year. I'm delighted that Ajay Banga, the U.S. candidate for World Bank president, is committed to continuing this work if he's selected. He has re recently returned from a three-week global listening tour that took him to Africa, Europe, Latin America, and Asia. I believe Ajay has the right leadership and management skills, along with the requisite experience building public-private partnerships to lead the World Bank at a critical moment in its history. It's more important than ever for the bank to deliver on its core development goals and evolution agenda. We look forward to the World Bank Board's selection. So, as you can see, we have a busy week ahead of us, and with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Secretary Yellen, for taking my question. Um, on the economy, there are increasing reports and surveys around the U.S. that lending uh, is getting tighter following the recent banking stress. Uh, are you seeing evidence of that in the data, and do you agree with the IMF's assessment that a credit, that a credit crunch uh, increases the likelihood of a hard landing, whether in the U.S. or globally? So I've not really seen evidence at this stage suggesting a contraction in credit, although that is a possibility. Um, I believe our banking system remains strong and resilient. It has um, solid capital and liquidity. And the U.S. economy is obviously performing 
exceptionally well with continued solid uh, job creation, inflation gradually moving down, um, robust consumer spending. So I'm not anticipating a downturn in the economy, although, um, of course, that remains a risk. Hi, Secretary Yellen. I have two questions. The first is on uh, the IMF has released a series of reports in recent weeks uh, warning about the economic consequences of fragmentation, and they've cited some of your calls for French shoring. So I'm curious if you have a response to that and the IMF's outlook that French shoring and fragmentation could reduce global growth. My second question is on uh, there's a Wall Street Journal reporter, Evan Gershkovich, who's been detained in Russia. And I'm wondering if that's something that you plan to bring up uh, with your counterparts uh, this week, and if Treasury is considering any sanctions or steps to address his detainment and the detainment of other Americans abroad. So let me start with friendshoring. Um, the way I see it, friendshoring is an approach to um, dealing with supply chain risks that are very real, but maintain um, tremendous scope for uh, global trade to continue. Um, we're mainly concerned about um, over-dependence on some critical areas for China and are seeking to reduce that dependence. But friendshoring includes a very wide range of partners, and so the benefits of um, open trade, which include more efficient allocation of global resources, is maintained with friendshoring. So I, I think the argument that friendshoring is going to cause huge fragmentation and loss of the benefits of trade is really not valid. But I definitely do think um, we've seen this in connection with the pandemic. Um, we've seen um, the damage that um, can be caused by over-dependence on countries. This is a connection with Russia and its war against Ukraine. We've seen the vulnerabilities that um, over-dependence on partners who may act in a ge geopolitical way. We've seen the risks that causes. And it is important to diversify our supply chains and make sure that they're resilient. And I believe friendshoring is a, is a good approach to it that avoids fragmentation. On the Wall Street Journal reporter, Mr. Gershkovich, I'm deeply concerned over Russia's detention of him. Um, this is something uh, the President, the Secretary of State have condemned, and I certainly want to join with them in condemning uh, in the strongest possible terms his wrongful detention. Um, more generally targeting American citizens, Russia's continued attempts to intimidate, repress, and punish independent journalists and civil society voices is a matter of great concern. Um, my own thoughts are with um, Mr. Gershkovitz's family, friends, and his colleagues at the Wall Street Journal and other news outlets that are bravely working to um, report the truth about Russia's barbaric war. And we are uh, thinking, and the country is thinking uh, of him and hoping for his um, release very soon. Hi, uh, Victoria Dendrino from Bloomberg. Um, I had a question about debt. You, you said you were going to talk about the issue of debt overhang this week. I was just wondering, first of all, how optimistic you are that there is going to be meaningful progress in these discussions this week, and more broadly, um, disag disagreements with China have been a, a big issue uh, in making headway in debt relief for these countries. Um, are you having any discussions with Chinese officials this week, and how important is it for you to intensify your dialogue with officials in China, um, more broadly on economic issues as well? 
we'll, we will have um, our first full-blown principles level meeting of the uh, sovereign debt roundtable, and China will be, I'm sure, an active participant in that. Um, I've been encouraged by China's willingness to provide um, specific assurances um, with respect to Sri Lanka. I regard that as a positive sign, and um, I'm hopeful that we will actually get a bit of progress coming out of uh, this first meeting of the Sovereign Debt Roundtable on um, a set of technical uh, issues that I think uh, pertain to some important elements of debt restructuring where I think we can agree. Of course, we will continue to press China uh, to participate um, in improving the common framework, making it work better. But um, I feel encouraged that uh, we have made a bit of progress and I hope to make more. Hi, uh, I wanted to follow up on Alan's question. Um, in the, the WIO this morning, the IMF said the outlook for the global economy is anemic and that there is turbulence below the surface. Um, but it sounds like you're more optimistic. I mean, c could you get into more detail about what you're seeing that the IMF may not be seeing and highlighting in terms of the outlook? So I do think um, the, the, the outlook is reasonable. It's certainly uh, stronger, brighter than the last time uh, we had the annual meetings in October. Um, global growth projections are higher than they were at that time. We're seeing diminished inflationary um, projections and um, diminished inflation in some parts of the world. Um, commodity prices have eased supply chain snarls are being resolved. Um, the financial, the global financial system has generally proven quite resilient. As I mentioned, the United States is doing extremely well economically with inflation coming down in a strong labor market and um, Europe is doing better than was feared at the time of our last meeting. So, um, I, I wouldn't overdo the negativism um, about the global economy. I think countries have proven resilient in number of emerging market. Um, at lower income countries um, continue to show resilient uh, growth. Uh, some of them are benefiting from uh, improvement in their terms of trade and um, they have built up buffers and taken strong macroeconomic policy actions. So I, I, th I think we should be more positive. Of course, there are risks. Um, many of them relate to Russia's war um, against Ukraine and the global outlook. I think the single best thing that we could do to improve the global outlook would be to end that barbaric war. But um, I think the outlook is reasonably bright. Hi, thank you, Secretary. Um, just on, on the MDB reform, uh, which is going to be discussed um, at these meetings, uh, there's obviously a lot of expectations that the proposal by the World Bank to increase lending by $50 billion over the next 10 years you know, will be accepted but there will be discussions on the next steps of that, of that reform. I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of what, what, what specific actions you expect to be, to be taken um, and, and what's the timing for that? Will we see some uh, movements beyond that initial 50 billion uh, by the time of the annual meetings in October? Thanks. So um, I, th I see this as an initial set of reforms but there is definitely more to be done. And what I'm hoping for is um, a phase in of uh, additional actions over the remainder of this year. Um, we hope to approve 
one of the most important recommendations from the capital adequacy framework set of recommendations, but there are many additional recommendations that I would uh, hope to see put in place. Um, we need to um, continue to work with the World Bank and other multilateral development banks to rationalize their use of concessional funding pools um, to um, evolve their use of diagnostic tools and their ability to respond not only um, to, um, to projects that come from a government, a national government, but also um, subnational projects, for example, at the level of cities or urban areas, or regional or supranational projects, that would be an important um, evolution. And of course, mobilization of private capital um, remains an important objective that's yet to be taken up. And so I hope to see progress on all of these um, elements uh, over the rest of the year. Uh, thank you very much, Secretary Yellen. Um, now that the IMF program for Ukraine has been agreed, um, is that going to be sufficient to meet uh, some of the short-term uh, economic needs for Ukraine? Um, what would you like to see in addition to that from uh, from uh, America's allies and Ukraine's allies from an economic point of view? And on a, on a separate note, uh, could you give us an update on your possible plans to visit China? Um, and what would it take for you to visit China? You mentioned you were encouraged by some of their um, uh, a a commitments uh, uh, in terms of Sri Lanka. Um, let's see. So in terms of um, my plans to visit China, I still hope to go. Um, President Biden has um, emphasized um, the importance of opening up and maintaining channels of communication, and um, I hope to go with the appropriate time. And just remind me, your first the first part was about Ukraine. Um, so look, we have indicated that we intend to um, stand behind Ukraine for as long as it takes. We're very pleased by the adoption of the IMF package. That's an important signal of broad international commitment to support Ukraine. The financing's important, and um, we've made commitments um, really to take us through next September, uh, the European Union uh, and others, their support essentially um, will take Ukraine through the remainder of this year. But if the war continues, um, we'll have to continue to work with our partners to um, provide the support that Ukraine needs, and we're committed to doing that. Um, I believe there's bipartisan strong bipartisan support for doing it, and the same is true um, of our partners. Um, so we will also have to um, focus on longer-term reconstruction needs in Ukraine. Um, we have set up a multi-donor platform that will serve to coordinate um, financing of all of the different parties that will be contributing to long-term reconstruction of Ukraine. Um, we're getting that uh, platform up and running, and it, it provides a way to develop a longer-term plan. In addition, we've allocated um, money for some immediate short-term reconstruction that Ukraine will prioritize, probably, for example, to its electric grid that will make sure its economy is able um, to function and get, get back to normal soon. So um, we'll be discussing um, 
financing needs for Ukraine and emphasizing our continued commitment to meeting Ukraine's needs.